For RCR Wireless News, I'm Sean Kinney, and to really get a good perspective on the entirety of what 5G involves, we put together a great panel of subject matter experts from Comscope. So gentlemen, as we get started, could we please go down the line here and have you introduce yourselves and uh, tell us a little bit about your role within Comscope. I'm Mike Brobston uh, from within the uh, RF Products uh, Business Unit of Comscope, uh, Director of Advanced Technology, uh, where our focus is mainly developing new technologies for base station antennas and filters, and a lot of our focus lately has been 5G uh, active antenna arrays. Ray Butler, Vice President of Mobility Network Engineering. Uh, I lead a team of uh, global 5G and 4G experts. We work with customers to help uh, understand their needs and uh, help with architectural solution uh, for each of our uh, customers. I'm Mike Wolf with Comscope. I'm part of Ray's network engineering team focusing on our customers that are located in North America and helping them to more efficiently evolve their networks from 4G to 5G. And I'm Mark Gibson. I work in the Comsearch division of Comscope and I'm the uh, director of business development for, for that uh, business unit and uh, my focus is on shared spectrum and shared spectrum operations to help uh, customers take more advantage of shared spectrum use. All right, so as we get into the discussion, let's uh, set a baseline. So Ray, this is, might sound like an easy question, but just want to make sure that we fully understand how Comscope is working in 5G across all of the different business groups. Sure, um, thanks Sean. So we're involved in uh, several different 5G groups, industry forum, if you will. Uh, for example, the POWER, P-A-W-R, the Platform for Advanced Wireless Research here in North America, which uh, includes 20 cities and different uh, op uh, suppliers providing a, a platform for uh, 5G testing and research. Uh, we're part of 5G Americas, part of 5Tonic, which is the Telefonica Forum, 5GMF in uh, Japan, as well as NGMN. And uh, we're actively engaged with these forums, uh, also uh, including XRAN and helping to um, look to the future and, and evolve 5G. So not only the industry forum, but also working closely with uh, operators and key customers to understand their evolution and as they, as they evolve their network from 4G to 5G and, and how to help them prepare for that uh, evolution. In addition to that, we are <coughs> developing products and solutions now in preparation for 5G, so those include uh, antennas, both base station antennas and terrestrial microwave antennas, uh, include in building products such as DAS and uh, small cell. We have densification solutions, so outdoor small cell, um, concealment and uh, densification products, and uh, all of the RF path products that, uh, <coughs> that will be needed for 5G. And, and we have a very broad and deep a fiber portfolio as well to help with the connectivity that will be needed for, uh, for 5G. All right, well Ray, we've uh, just gotten even as early as today some new announcements about commercial 5G rollouts from uh, Sprint, but you know, we've got a Verizon working to commercialize fixed wireless based on their technical forum, which will evolve to the NR spec. But just from your perspective, from a non-operator point of view, where is the industry in terms of commercially deploying 5G services? Yeah, so we see, <clears throat> we see a lot of movement. Uh, I think early on, like now, we're still seeing some trials. Those trials are evolving to be commercial uh, level trials um, and early deployments, as you mentioned, with fix, uh, fixed and also in other parts of the world we're hearing of commercial service. I think, though, to understand how this will evolve, we need to understand that there's an entire ecosystem that needs to evolve. So while there are some early uh, base stations, if you will, RAN equipment and core equipment that can support 5G, we also need to have, um, of course, the 5G UEs, the handsets need to be available and deployed in some volume before we'll see significant uh, penetration of, of the actual 5G service. So I still think uh, we'll continue to see more trials this year uh, fixed wireless deployments, we'll, we'll see some very serious uh, mobility type deployments beginning next year, but I think it'll be 2020 to 2021 before we start to see the service penetration start to, to reach uh, critical mass. 
uh, and all that entire 5G ecosystem still needs to evolve and, and, uh, and be in place. Right. And now if we could maybe switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, spectrum. Uh, obviously 5G spectrum is uh, seeming to be a mix of low, mid, and, and high band. Uh, 3.5 gigahertz globally, that's an attractive 5G band, but in the, uh, the U.S. we're well along the path towards uh, CBRS and shared access. So Mark, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Uh, what do you foresee CBRS taking shape when operators are actually able to use this and maybe non-operator interests are able to get those priority licenses? What's that going to look like? Uh, that's a great question. I was just on a panel where we were sort of toying with some of the, um, the great things about the CBRS band, 3.5 gig band. It, it sort of equalizes spectrum access for anybody that wants it. Um, which you don't really see in much spectrum these days uh, if it's you know, separated in terms of you know, spectrum that's bought at auction and, and not. So within the CBRS band, uh, you've got spectrum that for priority access license that you buy at an auction, similar to the way all spectrums have been bought at auction. Uh, and then there's a spectrum uh, that's available under what's called General Authorized Access, or GAA. And so depending upon your interest in spectrum assurity, you can either buy a license at PAL um, and, you know, like a traditional wireless carrier, use that spectrum for whatever, LTE, 5G or whatever. Um, or you can, for example, for private, uh, private networks, you can use the GAA uh, and offer up uh, your own network on spectrum that you share with others mo most co-equally. So that's the, one of the most interesting things about the CBRS band is that there's something in there for everyone uh, in all the 150 megahertz. So uh, we'll, we see a transition path. Um, I just got voted on the board of the CBRS Alliance and uh, the, one of the missions of the CBRS Alliance is to make LTE available for 5G in the uh, CBRS band. So at certain, we're looking at getting you know, that moving along. And uh, again, like I said, the great thing about the band is it makes something available for everybody. And uh, Mike Wolf, uh, you know, Comscope's been talking for years about network convergence as it relates to wireless and wireline, but really with all of these spectrum movements, I, I think it'd be accurate to say that you're seeing some convergence there as well, right? Right, we're seeing convergence not only with the spectrum activities that are going on, but we are starting to see signs of real convergence between the wireline and wireless sides of many of our customers and businesses, whether we're looking at internal changes that they're making organizationally to better support a converged future for their network, or whether we're looking at things like the early signs of uh, network function virtualization, where they're starting to set the stage to put more and more of the functions of these networks on both sides of the business into software type functions uh, where they can merge together more seamlessly and play and set kind of the platform for them to bring the access layers together as well. And so we definitely see you know, the future of a fiber dense network uh, being able to support both the wireline type traffic as well as, as wireless traffic and giving them a, a much more flexible and lower cost uh, platform that they can use for, for their future customers. Mm -hmm. And Ray, earlier you mentioned that Comscope plays heavily in in-building wireless systems, DAS, small cell, hybrid of the two. Um, what does 5G pretend for in-building systems? Well, I think as we look at um Okay, as you look at data in general, 80% of data is consumed in building, and we talk a lot about outdoor and small cells and macro towers, but really in buildings where a lot of the action will be. And we've introduced uh, recently a couple of new platforms that will help evolve uh, in building networks to 5G. The first of those is the ERA platform, ERA, and this is the only DAS platform in the world where, where we have completely digital transport. So from input to output, it takes um, uh, RF analog inputs or CIPRI inputs, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, transport those to the remote units for, uh, for in-building coverage. Uh, and we see this as a platform for the future, completely flexible, dramatically reduces the, uh, the, the amount of space needed to deploy a product as well as to uh, reduce the cost of that product. And then the flexibility, it's all programmed programmable by software. So I think that if you think about Cloud RAN and CRAN um, and moving forward, this definitely is leading the way towards true um, uh, manageable CRAN in building for the multi-operator, multi-band, multi-technology scenarios. Uh, so that could be 5G as well as other, other technologies. And then another uh, platform what we have is called OneCell. 
And this is a uh, flexible small cell platform. Uh, this time it's, it's single operator for in-building and, and basically it provides a user-centric cell. So the, the cell follows the user around the coverage area inside the building. Uh, it's very easy to deploy and uh, uh, just a 5G architecture available today for uh, 4G LTE service in building. So I'm pretty excited about both of these platforms and uh, depending on how a building owner might decide to deploy coverage in their building, uh, either of these can be a very flexible uh, solution. All right, very good. And then um, I, I mentioned it in passing, this uh, fixed wireless application of, of 5G, but Mike, I was hoping maybe you could give us a little more of an in-depth look at that. Uh, why is 5G fixed wireless an attractive solution for operators? Uh, is it related to the infrastructure cost of deploying fiber to the directly to the home? Does it help kind of solve that last mile issue? Sure, yeah, and, and fixed wireless, of course, is nothing new. It's been around quite a while, but um, particularly in the context of 5G, you know, it's delivering that last several hundred meters of broadband access service to the subscribers you know, using a wireless link, primarily the 5G air interface, um, from a network of access points and with effectively fiber connecting those access points uh, back to the network. Um, so, yeah, the, um, definitely the advantage for the operators is one is uh, deployment cost. Uh, there appears to be a clear cost advantage to rolling out a network uh, versus, and uh, you know, having to trench up the streets and front yards, so uh, quite a bit of cost savings there. And another critical aspect is just the deployment time where an operator may not have the time to go through all the permitting processes and you know the uh, trenching processes, whereas the fiber network can be deployed in a relatively quick time frame. And it, if I can build on that a little bit, in terms of the site acquisition piece, if you're out building fixed wireless sites uh, with the end goal of also delivering a mobile service, are you able to reuse those sites and kind of save yourself the, the headache of going through a second site acquisition process? Definitely, and I think that's the plan for operators who are looking at fixed wireless rollouts is reusing those sites for mobile as that market comes around. You know, definitely the 5G fixed wireless looks like you know, the initial use case for 5G, uh, probably the, the um, lowest risk one to deploy, um, whereas once mobility comes around, they still plan to use that same network for mobility service. Okay. And uh, Ray alluded to, uh, to CRAN and, and centralizing this equipment as a, a way to reduce your OPEX and gain some other efficiencies. But uh, Mike, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit more about this idea of, of open RAN. What is that and uh, what is that going to mean for operators as we move towards 5G? Yeah, well, there are several uh, initiatives you know, around that. Um, the one Comscope is involved in is, is called XRAN. And, um, XRAN is the, the objective there is to standardize the interface between the radio and the baseband uh, for the intent of centralizing the, the baseband functions. Uh, I mean, if you look at all the interfaces throughout the RAN and back into the core, they're all standardized interfaces except for that front hall. Um, so that's uh, XRAN's objective is to uh, write a specification, an open specification around that front hall interface. Uh, and, and go beyond you know, what the eCIPRI is of just defining the transport layer, so taking it into defining you know, the, not just the data plane, but the control, maintenance, synchronization planes. So you truly get complete interoperability between uh, any XRAN compliant radio equipment and XRAN compliant baseband equipment, regardless of what operator is supplying those. And finally, Ray, I wanted to hear from you about the challenges that network operators face today and compare those to the challenges that they're going to face with operating a 5G network. What are some of those really key problems that they're going to have to overcome? Okay, thanks, Sean. So we look at the world a lot from how the network is deployed and how it is optimized. So I think a lot of the same challenges that are experienced today will carry forward to 5G. 
Now we talk in terms of PBS, so power, backhaul, and site acquisition. Uh, from a power perspective, if we're talking about densifying and having many, many more small cells, if you will, that are 5G or 5G capable, we have to get power and we have to get backhaul to each of those sites, to each one of those poles, if you will. So uh, we're looking at innovative ways to solve each of these issues. Um, in today's world, uh, a lot of times there'll be a, an AC hookup, but we're looking at solutions that uh, would deploy distributed DC power as a more economical and we believe a quicker solution for power to the, to the pole uh, or to the site. Um, from a site acquisition perspective, we, we're looking at solutions that are more aesthetically pleasing, that will make it easier to get zoning commission approvals. Those issues will continue and in fact may even get worse as, as more sites fill in. Of course, we hear a lot about the, the regulations and, and discussion about making things easier, but I think they'll continue to be um, a, a challenge to deploy for some time in the future for 5G or 4G. It's more about the site than the technology in some cases. And then um, the backhaul, um, some of what Mike was talking about and, and, uh, and, and uh, both Mike's about convergence. And uh, we think from uh, the perspective of leveraging those fiber assets uh, that are either installed now or will be installed in the future, um, essentially every 4G site that's uh, deployed today is gonna have fiber to the site. You're gonna need that for 5G as well. And so that, um, fiber to the site and how is that investment leveraged between wireline and wireless uh, to take full advantage of, of the capabilities that are, exist today. So I think those issues will continue. I think in addition, we're gonna need more spectrum. So there's some regulatory uh, things like what Mark was talking about. Uh, we expect 3.5 to be a global band and, and there are uh, steps being taken in the US to, to expand the bandwidth, uh, as you know. So I think those issues that we've already experienced in 4G will continue in 5G as well. And I think Comscope is uniquely positioned to bring both the fiber connectivity and the RF path and the radio expertise to bear uh, in a single company. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with us and talk about some of these important issues that are really shaping the way that 5G is going to be commercialized. Thank you.